always had a lot of friends, I guess. You know, going to school has always been awesome. That was kind of a problem, though, because when I was uh, younger, made it out to so that I would just start um, doing drugs, and I got into that scene um, real fast. Basically, the influence of me doing drugs was uh, brought on by me just hanging out with friends, and that just came around us, and we just started getting into it. I did, I smoked a lot of pot, but I also got into uh, some, you know, acid, and, you know, taking the mushrooms. It was a lifestyle for me. That's what I did. I was known as, uh, once I got into that, I was known as, you know, a drug user, and that's what I was liberal as. I just didn't care about God. I, I pushed him aside and said, you know, whatever. My friends were atheists and they, they had no like kind of Christian influences on their life. So I kind of leaked into my um, my philosophy of the world and stuff. When I try to express, um, you know, it's kind of soft. So I'm kind of, you know, over it. I'm doing, I'm smoking too much. I'm, I'm popping too many pills. I'm, I'm just, I'm in too deep. You know, they'd be like, oh, dude, you're fine. You know, I need to worry about this. You know, you're just having a good time. My parents, they tried to like separate me from the drug the lifestyle that, that I was, entrenched in, but um, basically I was at school with my friends still. Basically the breaking point was me having to go to West Hills Mental Hospital because I, I slashed myself up with a razor because I was on morphine pills. My parents called the cops. I went to a uh, detention center for a night to evaluate me. I was unstable, so they sent me to rehab. After I came back from rehab, my friends definitely uh, pressured me, you know, just to go back, because, you know, I was their you know, party buddy. I got smoke, drink, booze with them. I guess that shows you that, they, you know, they really weren't that good of friends in the first place if they, if they couldn't realize that I, I had a serious problem, and they just wanted to put me back in that situation, that position. You know, I, I've run into a lot of my friends that, you know, were part of that scene. When I talk to them, you know, just, you know, running into them, they're like, yeah, dude, you've changed. You know, I just totally tell them, you know, it's, it's Christ. You know, I've changed my life. You know, I'm not going down that path anymore. You know, I have a bright future with Jesus Christ in the center of it. The sad thing is that they're still in that place where I was. They're still doing drugs, partying, and all that other stuff. I have a heart for them still, you know. I, I don't separate myself from them. I try to talk to them about God, and I try to show them that, yeah, you know, you just toss this life away and focus your um, life on Jesus Christ, and, you know, you, you, your life will be amazing. Once again, um, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Just making sure we are on. I think we are. Yes. <clears throat> All right, wonderful. Hope you had a good day. Amen. Yes. Amen. <laughs> All right, I, I, I'll take, if I were to poll that, it wouldn't come up very high. <laughs> but I'll take it. I know some people had so much to do. Somebody said it was a long week. You know, the grass is growing quickly. You cut your grass. You have to do all kind of things to get here. So I'm just thankful that God has protected us and blessed us and brought us here together. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> just want to remind you that tomorrow evening we'll be back tomorrow morning and tomorrow evening and then on Sunday evening Amen. as we begin our last week and I trust that, um, you know, God is amazing. Amen. And uh, oftentimes, he does things that we don't expect him to. And we are just awed by the miracle of his work. So let's continue to pray that he, is con he will continue to work in us and in others to draw us all closer to him. Uh, this evening, our topic has changed from what we not had printed out before. And, and so I'll be coming from one of the Gospels, not, not John mainly, but the, uh, a story based in one of the Gospels. And the, the topic of our presentation this evening is entitled, Living Among the Tombs. Living Among the Tombs. And so that's where we will be focused on for this evening. Um, before we do that, our theme for our series is that we would receive God's word and believe in him so we can be adopted by God. So let's see if we can say this theme thought together and um, then as we say it, let's say it like we believe it. All right, are we ready? Each day, 
we rise, we experience hope. We receive the word and believe in him. We become a son or daughter of God. Amen. Gracious God, we rise once again with hope in our hearts that you would draw us into, your, into a closer relationship with you. That we would receive and believe your word so you could anoint us, adopt us, call us sons and daughters of God. We pray now that your words tonight would be like bread, food, life to us. And we would eat it up and receive it so we can become more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Living amongst the two. And that's the text we will read. So you have your Bibles. We're, gonna, we're just going to read the story. So like we're having some feedback. We'll just read the story. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broke in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountain. So all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. When the unclean spirit went out and entered the swine, there were about 2,000 and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then, last verse, they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legions sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. This story So our favorite gospel that we've been is not recorded there but it's such an important story that I wanted us to focus on it this evening. So it's recorded in Matthew, Mark and Luke. How Jesus set free one of the gospels said two and some said one man who was controlled and imprisoned by demons. But as I read the Bible and reflect on this story, I am reminded that this is what Jesus enjoys doing. Setting free those who are imprisoned by the devil. He specializes in doing this. He has the power to set us free. The power to save us from sin. And in a very special way you will agree with me that today like never before we can say that we are free but today like never before we are controlled by the devil and imprisoned by our wild and unmanageable passions and our vile and sinful lusts so many of us are enslaved and imprisoned by modern devils. 
drugs, pornography, materialism, sexual sins, sinful pride. Many wanting to be free, but the devil has us locked behind the bars of these prisons. Remember, some years ago, I met a young man who had been actually in prison. He had served his time and was now free from prison. But he was not free from drugs. And as we discovered his story, while he was in prison, somebody had studied the Bible with him. And so he turned up in church one Sabbath and showed interest in spiritual things. And we studied with him some more and he requested baptism. He was baptized. But we could still see that he was not yet free from the prison of drugs. That the hold that this habit had on his life was still strong. And I remember that the men in the church decided that they would do their very best to support him. One of our gentlemen in the church was a contractor who gave him a job. And as we explore the story with him, how best we could help him, the, the understanding was, and many of you may not even know that, you know, when you're born in a certain context, sometimes other contexts you don't quite understand. But that the context for many drug addicts are that they would work hard all week. And then they would reward themselves after they get paid. And so their reward was to buy drugs. And so the church decided that since Friday evening after he got paid was the time when the, the prison bars of his habits would close closer around him. That they would be supportive of him, even at his weakest moments. And they tried and they prayed and they worked with him. But unfortunately, he drifted away and slipped back into his habits. But I met another young man, also who was in prison, came out of prison. His mom was a member of the church. He came to church and decided he wanted to give his life to Christ. He had to give up the drugs that he was attracted to. I remember when I had that discussion with him and I shared with him that if you wanted Christ you have to change your life. I didn't know how difficult it would be for him. But I remember that he shared with me that one of the, one of the things he had to give up was the girlfriend he had because she was also on drugs. And so he walked away from her. Gave his life to Christ got baptized, God gave him a, a, a girl from the church. They got married. And today he is a drug counselor with the Salvation Army. So God has the power to set us free even when we may be imprisoned by habits, imprisoned by our past, imprisoned by these modern devils. The, 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 the paradox of our times in history it are the challenges that we face in our modern lives. That we may have taller buildings, but shorter tempers, wider freeways, but narrower viewpoints. We spend more, but we have less. We buy more, but we enjoy less. We have bigger houses and smaller families. More conveniences, but less time. We have more degrees, 
but less sense. More knowledge, but less judgment. More experts, yet more problems. More medicine, but less wellness. We drink too much, smoke too much, spend too recklessly, laugh too little, drive too fast, get too angry, stay up too late, get up too tired, read too little, watch TV too much, and pray too seldom. We have multiplied our possessions, but reduced our values. We talk too much, love too seldom, and hate too often. We have learned how to make a, li a living, but not a life. We have added years to life, but not life to years. We have been all the way to the moon and back, but have trouble crossing the street to say hi to our neighbor. We have conquered outer space, but not inner space. We have done larger things, but not better things. We have cleaned up our air, but polluted our souls. We have conquered the atom, but we have not conquered our prejudices. We write more, but learn less. We plan more, but accomplish less. We have learned to rush, but not to wait. We build more computers to hold more information, to produce more copies than ever, but we communicate less and less. These are the times of fast food and slow digestion. Big men and small characters, steep profits but shallow relationships. These are the days of two income but more divorces, fancier houses but more broken homes. These are the days of quick trips, disposable diapers, throwaway morality, one night stands, overweight bodies, and pills that do everything from cheer to quiet to kill. So we can truly say in these times, we do need a savior. And so when we look at the story that we read from scripture, the Bible said the men were controlled by many demons. But they were not born that way. So let's fill in some of the details. These men all had a mom and a dad like we all do. These men were brought up living in decent homes with parents who perhaps took them to the synagogue every Sabbath morning, took them to church every weekend. No doubt they grew up as little boys playing around the village of Gadara, running to school through the olive, olive groves around the villages. No doubt they had similar experiences to the experiences that we now had. But the question is this, what occurred, what occurred in the lives of these two boys that transferred them from two innocent, carefree little boys into fierce, demon-controlled men? What occurred? Men who, as the Bible said, lived amongst the tombs. They lived on, as outcasts of their society. These, the people amongst whom they lived, were afraid of them. The Bible said that they had chains hanging on them because oftentimes they would be chained, but they would snap the chain, cut themselves, and all night long you could hear their horrible, inhuman screams echoing through the tombs. They had the remains of shackles on them, on their hands, on their feet, broken pieces of chain. All attempts to, to free them from the bonds of past habits, the bonds of past sins had failed so often that guilt and shame now eroded their self-esteem. And one of the things I've discovered in society in which we live. That many times in an attempt to free us from something, we become enslaved to other things. And so if you want healing from some uh, illness you have, some disease that you have, you have to take a pill for the rest of your life. 
I've discovered that for some people to get over heroin, they have to become addicted to methadone. And so what brought these two young men to this experience? And I would begin to suspect that they had played with sin in their youth and it was now bearing fruit. And we're all like these men, chained to the demons of our past, still chained to pride and self-egotism, still chained to alcohol and drug addiction, still chained to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life. All previous attempts to break the power of sin in our lives, to break the hold of the devil over us, only involve exchanging one bondage for another, one drug for another, one sin for another. So today we have exchanged cigarette and tobacco for the patch. We have exchanged prostitution for pornography. And so all we have done is exchanged one set of chains for another. Archaeological evidences show that the region around the village home of these men was covered in limestone hills. And among these hills were caves and man-made caverns. These served as tombs and burial sites for the dead. It was among these wild and uninhabitable graves and tombs, a place for the dead that these men lived. I want you to get that. That the men lived in a place for the dead. Because their lives had been given over to the devil. Because they were now enslaved by the habits of their past and the habits of their lives. Daily they wandered amongst the tombs. Sleeping amongst the tombs. Eating amongst the tombs. This is what their lives had come to living amongst the tombs. Can you imagine what it is like living amongst tombs? Yet so often we could find ourselves living among the tombs. Living among the tombs is a sign that we are spiritually dead. It's a sign that we are spiritually enslaved. It's a sign that we have surrendered ourselves to demons of doubts and devils of despair. Living amongst the tombs mean that we have given up to that sin that so easily beset us. That we are no longer fighting to overcome that perverted practice, that sinful state, that immoral issue, that heathen habit, or that wicked way we have just surrendered. There are many people, even believers, who may appear to live normal lives on the outside. But inside, we wrestle with a barrage of guilty, sinful thoughts, envy, greed, sexual lusts, hate, apathy, pride. We are enslaved when we have virtually no devotional lives. We are enslaved when prayer is a frustrating experience and you struggle with interpersonal relationships. And most people who find themselves in this experience have no idea that they are perhaps in a spiritual conflict. We have allowed the devil to infiltrate our thoughts and enslave our habits. But like the demon-possessed men, we all need to find salvation at the feet of Jesus. Mark chapter 5 and verse 6 said, When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. At the feet of Jesus, victories are won. At the feet of Jesus, trials can be overcome. At the feet of Jesus, Chains can be broken. At the feet of Jesus, habits can be overcome. 
At the feet of Jesus, hearts are open and blessings can flow. But it can only happen at the feet of Jesus. That's why Christ himself said in John chapter 10 and verse 10. In John chapter what? 10 and verse 10. I just want to read it here. It says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill. And the greatest thief of all is the devil himself. He came to our world and he stole our joy in the Lord. He came to our world and he stole our affection from God. He came to this world to steal our worship from God. So he comes not only except to steal and then to kill. And to destroy. But Jesus tells us, he says, but I have come that they might have life. And that you might have it more abundantly. Somebody say amen. amen. I'm saying. Even to the spiritually dead. Even to those who live amongst the tombs. Jesus is ready to bring life. He comes healing amongst the tomb. He visits to give life amongst the tomb. He stops by to set us free. Even from amongst the tombs. That's what the God that we serve the, do. All around us in this world are many who are enslaved in sin. Seeking to break loose from their habits. But Jesus is nearby. Mark tells us that Jesus got out of the boat. In Mark chapter 5. When he came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes, and when he had come out of the boat, verse 2, immediately they met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. And I want you to just picture now, Jesus stepping out of the boat with all the disciples with him. Perhaps they landed, I'm going to paint a picture, on a little rocky beach. It might have had just a little spit of sand. Above the beach, the rocks multiply. There is a rocky, desolate landscape dotted with caves. And Jesus, who had traveled across the lake, had come to this place for some respite, for some rest, for a little time to be alone with his disciples. And so Jesus... And his disciples stepped out of the boat, heading for one of these little caves, thinking the entrance to one of these little caves would be a good place to rest. But peering through the trees and the rocks are two creatures. Their eyes are bloodshot and red. They are snarling like wild animals ready to charge. Dangling from their wrists are broken lengths of chains as if they were once chained like dangerous wild dogs the hair on their bodies are thick and unkempt both bodies are bloody and battered as if they had been beaten they wore no clothes but their bodies were partly covered with moldy pieces of rags then suddenly with an inhuman unearthly scream the two creatures sprang from their hiding places and with murderous eyes filled with hate, they dashed furiously toward Jesus and the disciples. Well, all 12 disciples turned and fled, sprinting as if their lives depended on it. They moved so fast that when Peter relate, perhaps when Peter related the story later on for Mark to record in the Gospels, because Mark records what was related to him by Peter. Peter moved so fast, he could only remember that there was one wild man. The other Gospels, Matthew and Mark, from their research, 
reported that they remembered that there were two men. But Jesus, standing alone, is not afraid. <laughs> the creator is not afraid of the created. The life giver is not afraid of the dead. You can always depend on Jesus when the chips are down. He is there for you. When you are in trouble, the song says he's always on the double. My Jesus will stand by you. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. Even though your friends forsake you. And your parents desert you. And your spouses abandon you. My Jesus will stand up for you. And even the demons come to realize that Jesus is not about to run. <laughs> and so verse 6 tells us that the man possessed by a demon fell down to worship Jesus. The demons were in full control of these men. Nobody, not even with chains, could bind them. These are indeed demons from hell. In raging fury, they had tried to scare Jesus, but when he didn't run, they fell down and worshipped him. And you know one thing I've discovered is that the devil is smart, smarter than us, but he's not smarter than Jesus. <laughs> he should have had the demons run the other way from Jesus. Because if you read the story, I, I told you, Jesus had just crossed the lake. Jesus had been on the lake that night. And while Jesus was on the lake, the devil decided to get him. Jesus was in a boat with his disciples, tired from a day of ministry. He fell asleep while he was in the boat with his disciples. And the devil thought, now is my time. And so the devil sent a storm on that lake that night. And as the storm began to blow and the waves began to increase and the thunders began to sound and the lightning began to flash, the disciples who were skilled fishermen, they were used to this lake. They had been out in the lake and the storms. They had experienced storms in their lives before. They had handled it on their own. But when the devil sends an inspired storm, that is something that you can't take care of. And so though they bailed and they used all of their nautical skills, hoping to save themselves, it came to a point when they turned to Jesus, who was fast asleep in the storm. That shows you how frightened Jesus was. He was fast asleep. Because he knew he could handle it. And when Jesus can handle it, then you can go asleep. He knew he could take care of it. And so when the disciples turned to him and spoke to him, Jesus stood up. He rebuked the storm. The wind and the waves obeyed him. The demon who had tried to kill him and his disciples on the boat, they realized that Jesus was too powerful. And so, if the devil was smart, he would have remembered what Jesus had done not so many hours before on that lake. But now he tried again, but Jesus withstood him. All his demons fell down and worshipped before the Son of God. The devil had lost again. And now his demons begged not to be expelled into outer darkness. And that is why I believe, my friends, that regardless, talking to you now, regardless of what you, regardless of what I may be facing, regardless of what habits or temptation the devil may put in our way, even if he has control over us living amongst the tombs, we can call on Jesus at any time of day or night. And when Jesus turns up in our lives, the devil will be running for cover. Yeah. Isaiah 54 verse 17 says, No weapons formed against you shall prosper. It won't work. 
regardless of what the devil throws at us, all his weapons, Jesus is still stronger. Philippians 4 verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Zechariah 4 verse 6 says, not by might, nor by what? Power, but by what? My spirit, says the Lord of hosts, that God has power to give us so we can be victorious over every habit that so easily besets us. And so the demons beg Jesus, don't send us too far. Don't banish us into outer space, into outer darkness. They knew that Jesus had the power. And when you read the Bible, uh, chapter 5 and verse 9 of Mark, they told Jesus, he said, what is your name? And he answered and said, my name is Legion, for we are many. The Bible commentary points out that a legion is a Roman army division of 6,000 footmen and 700 horsemen. So there were indeed legions of demons. 6,700 demons in this man. Legions of demons. There were perhaps demons of hatred. Demons of pride. Demons of lust. Demons of greed. Demons of vanity. Demons of vice. Demons of drugs. And demons of darkness. There were big demons and small demons. For big habits and small vices. Demons of envy. And demons of appetite. Demons of adultery. And demons of fornication. There were demons called dishonesty. Corruption. Materialism. Idolatry. Uncontrollable temper. Selfish ambition. Alcoholism. Conflict and rebellion. Factions and division. Six. 1,700 demons is enough that you could have a fresh demon every month for 18 and a half years. But when Jesus turns up, these legions of demons beg and tremble. Too often we believe that we can't overcome. Too often we believe that the devil is stronger than Jesus. Too often we believe that our habits are too powerful. Too often we believe that it is okay to just surrender to these habits. It is okay to just surrender to these behaviors. But the Bible is saying that Jesus has power over thousands of demons. Over all demons. That regardless of what the devil throws at you, Jesus has an answer. Amen. That's what the Bible is saying. If you call on Jesus, <laughs> he can therefore cast out any demon that control your life today. There is no habit in your life. There is no demon in your past that can match my Jesus. The song says, no one understands like Jesus. Hebrew tells us, it says, for we have not an high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses and infirmities. Jesus knows exactly what we are going through. And regardless of what we are going through, Jesus has the power to give us victory over whatever it is. It says, therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's his promise. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. That when, when you are at your weakest, that's when Jesus has come. Amen. When you are thinking, I can't make another step, that's when Jesus says, come. Amen. When you think you cannot overcome, that's when Jesus says, I am here with you. And you can make it. Because I understand what you're going through. Come to the throne of grace. Find mercy. Find grace to help you when you have your time of need. So Jesus has the power to release us from the prisons of our past secret sins. 
He has the power to save us from the chains of our present condition. 1 John 1 and verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He, hallelujah, is faithful, amen, praise the Lord, and just, thank you Jesus, and will forgive us of our sins, and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. By now somebody knowing what God has done should be saying, thank you Jesus. Yes, he is able if we confess our sins. I don't know what sin may be hampering our lives. I don't know what challenge we may be facing. I don't know what hiccups are becoming stumbling blocks in accepting fully Jesus Christ. But his text says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. He won't let you down. He is faithful. He won't turn his back on you. He is faithful. You can always trust him. He is faithful and just. He will forgive you of your sins. And he will cleanse you, purify you from all unrighteousness. So Jesus cast out the demons. The Bible says they went into some pigs that were nearby who fled into the sea. The people who were keeping the pigs, they got so scared. They ran off. In fact, <laughs> they realized that they're, 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 they weren't going to get paid that week. Because they lose all the pigs that they were supposed to take care of. So they ran to tell the owner. It wasn't our fault. There's a man called Jesus who is doing some funny business. And so the whole village came, came through the olive groves. They came to find Jesus sitting in the tombs. They came and found the man sitting in the tombs. No longer naked, but now they were clothed. And I'd like to believe that they weren't just clothed with a robe or a borrowed rag from goodwill. I would like to believe that they were clothed with the faith that Jesus Christ had given to them. I'd like to believe that they were clothed with the hope that Jesus Christ had given to them. I'd like to believe that they were clothed with the truth that they were sons of God who God had forgiven of their past behaviors and had set them free and now they had hope in Jesus Christ. The Bible says they were sitting clothed and in their right minds. Not only were they clothed in their right garments, but they were also clothed in their right mind. When we give God an opportunity to take charge of our life, he reorient our mind. Because some of us know we think things we shouldn't think. We have thoughts we know we shouldn't have. But God, who is good, is able even to fix our wicked thoughts. God, who is merciful, is able even to reorient and reschedule how we think. Our negative thoughts. So when the devil tells us, you are no good. God tells us, no, you are okay because you're a son and you're a daughter of God. Amen. When the devil feeds us negative thoughts that would destroy our self-esteem, that would cause, like we've seen so many nights in these little clips that we've been watching, where people sometimes want to kill themselves and cut themselves and hurt themselves and destroy their own lives because they have allowed the devil to take charge of their thoughts. God is able to fix our thoughts. Amen. And to chase the enemy, the devil, away from controlling our lives. And so the Bible says, when they came, these two men who were once wild and dangerous, naked, controlled by demons, now they were in plain view. They were like two testimonies of the power of God 
in our world today. Two testimonies of God's ability to save us when we surrender to him. Seated at the feet of Jesus, clothed in their right mind. Jesus can do it all for you. He can do it all for me. Whatever are your demons today, Jesus is here to set you free. He deletes our past and he puts over us his banner of love and saving grace. So when Satan says you can't overcome, tell him in the name of Jesus, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So beloved, I, I want to close with us claiming what Jesus is able to do for us. I want us to close by believing right now that Jesus is ready to rebuke any habit, any sinful thoughts, any desires that is unbiblical, unchristlike, ungodly, that may be controlling our thoughts and our habits, that Jesus is able to give us victory over those habits. To set us free. To give us the power. That we tonight can ask Jesus to free us from those habits. To save us from those sins. To say, Jesus, I worship you. Give me victory over that habit. Give me victory over that demon in my life. Lord, clothe me in my right mind. Are you ready tonight to make that claim? There's none of us here that can say that we are perfect. But all of us here can say, but for the grace of God, I would be like those two men living amongst the tombs. But tonight Jesus is saying, he's here to give us victory over every habit that we may have. And so while we hear nothing between my soul and my Savior, I'm going to invite you to stand tonight. I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Make it your prayer. This brief prayer that we have on the screen tonight. Make it your prayer. I'll read the words for you and then you repeat the words after I read them. And let's say together in a powerful way, claiming God's promise to set us free from whatever it is. Because people today are hooked to things. Sometimes when we realize what we are hooked up to and connected to, we realize that we are substituting eternity for nothing. But tonight Jesus is promising us eternity. And so let's pray you can bow your heads, I'll read the words, and then you repeat those words after me as we claim God's promises. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I, need your victory I need your victory over the demons and sinful habits in my life. I cannot do it myself. This evening, I claim your victory. Thank you, Lord, for giving it to me. Amen. Won't you say amen again? Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. May we go tonight with the certainty of your victory because you have cast out demons out of our lives, cast out habits out of our lives, and set us free to serve and worship you in our right mind. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Be seated, please. Pastor Ryan is going to come and take us through the quiz. It's time for Kahoot. <laughs> Kahoot. While that's loading, if you don't have the app, again, you can find that in your app store. We'll have the code up here in just a moment. And we do have some prizes tonight, so I'm going to tip you off to that. So you want to make sure that you answer as quickly and accurately as you can to get those high scores. go the pen is on the screen <laughs> I 
I think it's funny the game has to remind us to behave. All players, all right. Anybody else? There we go. One more of our regulars. We have one more. Okay. All right, let's get started. First question of the night. When Jesus comes back, the wicked will be given another chance to be saved. True or false? When Jesus comes back, the wicked will be given another chance to be saved. That is correct. Decisions have been made. All right. Good job. Next question for the night. All of society worships someone or something. True or false? Everyone, everyone worships someone or something. That is true. It may not be God, it may not be Jesus, but they may worship something else. Maybe self, maybe uh, materialism, what have you. Yeah, good job. All right, third question for the night. Babylon got his name by being a really social place. True or false? Babylon got his name by being a very social place. Okay, so Babylon got his name because God confused the speech of those trying to build the tower, hence the babbling. Babel, babble. Not so much on the social. Yes, good job. Next question, Sabbath keeping means getting somebody else to do your work. True or false, Sabbath keeping means getting someone else to do your work. You come see teacher after class. Good job. Good job. All right, last question for the night. Who's going to be the winner? Trusting and believing Jesus leads to keeping the law. True or false? Trusting and believing in Jesus leads to keeping his law. That is true. You try to please the ones you love. Jay, who's Jay? Come on down. We have a prize for you. All right, so you get a book, and you get one of our nifty pens for the Hope Channel. Good job. All right, Jay. All right, who is... Who is Mar? Mar, will you come down for me? I'm going to give you one of these pins, too. Good job. Can we get a round of applause for our winners tonight? All right. Good job. As soon as we're ready, let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being able and for being willing to release us from our shackles, from all the things that catch up to us when no one else is looking, mm -hmm. and in the darkest Welcome hours of our own night. Voiceover speech descriptions of items on the screen. Father, please continue to work in our lives to redeem us, bring us closer to you. Be with each of these people here tonight. Bless them in your own special way. Keep them safe and bring them back to us soon. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.